Hello everyone and welcome to All Things Air Quality. This series of videos will look at basic isokinetic calculations that are associated with isokinetic stack testing. The series will be split up into multiple videos, the first of which will be looking at velocity, how it's measured and how it is calculated. Here I got us a little snip of a Type S pitot tube. The technician on site will use a pitot tube typically and insert it into the stack at a predetermined point. For example, there can be 12 points on this axis that will be measured and in, in most cases, if it's a circular stack, it should be a second port, 90 degrees from this board over here, which will also be used for measurements. So if you do 12 points in this line, you will do 12 points in this perpendicular line as well. There is specified method as to how the points are calculated and where they should be. The US EPA uses a method that divides the stack conduct into equal areas. If there is gas flowing or stack moving in this way, the flow profile won't necessarily just be a straight line like this. In other words, the velocity won't be the same at this location necessarily as in the middle. It might and it will most likely be slow next to the walls of a stack and it will be bigger in the middle. There is detailed methodology on how to calculate the points and where they should be, so I will not be going into it in this video. Now this measurement in most cases is done with a pitot tube as I said, and the pitot tube measures differential pressure, not velocity directly. So the velocity is actually calculated from the differential pressure. Now what does all this mean and how is it done? This is a type 1 pitot tube, this is just the other side of a type 1 pitot tube. How the type 1 works, it has a single channel tube that's open throughout the middle and it has an outer sieve. What's not drawn onto my version, but what you can see on the right hand side here is these little static holes. These holes are on the outer sieve, so there will be perhaps one there, one there, all the way around the tube. They are connected to the second leg over here. You have your measurement device over here. I'm just going to draw us a big black box for now. The center tube or the positive line is connected via a tubing. The negative line, let's go and make that yellow, is connected to the other side of it. So this is your umbilical cords or what we call them. And that's a very badly drawn one, but you get the idea. They are connected to your measuring device. And at each point you'll get a measurement that we will call differential pressure. As mentioned before, these pressure measurements are made at the predetermined traverse point, all 12 of them if you use 12, and then the other 12 in the other axis. And it is recorded. But how this device actually works, when I mean, modern ones are typically digital micrometers, the principle is very easily explained from an older or the fundamental technology type, which is a YouTube manometer. It's typically just a glass tube that's bent into a U and it is filled with a liquid. So typically a very dense liquid. In the past it used to be mercury, but uh, that's not done anymore because obviously we learned mercury is not very good for your health. We don't want to work with that stuff. It's nasty. This manometer is filled up with that liquid. Your probe is in the stack like this, there will be air pushing into the center line of your probe and it will exert a pressure on this liquid. What is going to happen in your liquid? That pressure that's pushing it down on the one side is going to cause it to move to a lower level here and it, the corresponding increase will happen on the other side. So now we all of a sudden have this change in height in this manometer of ours. This height can be measured with a ruler, so you measure this distance or you have it on a graduated background where you can actually take a measurement typically in units of millimeters of water or many inches of mercury perhaps. And like I said, we measure differential pressure. So why am I now measuring a distance? Because pressure is related to Height or pressure can be equated to a height, and to give you some idea, one millimeter of water is about equal to 9.8 Pascal. If we look at the equation that I'm just going to quickly throw up here for us, uh, tells us, sorry, it just took me a while to get it up here. 
that velocity is equal to some constant multiplied by the square root of 2 delta p over rho. In this case, rho is the density of a gas, and this delta p is the differential pressure that is measured with your manometer over here. The equation is derived from something that's called the Bernoulli equation, and what is in effect happening is the pressure that's being exerted here due to flow is in effect some sort of conversion of the kinetic energy of the gas to a potential energy over here. For a type 1 pitot tube, that CV factor is 0.99, or in some cases people use 1. For a type S pitot tube over here, it is 0.84 if your pitot tube is built up to a certain standard and is not damaged. Now, if we are measuring, another question that might arise, if we are measuring this kinetic energy through here, why do we have this second leg connected? If you work on a stack, the stack might not necessarily be at the same pressure that you are. But let's say here the stack pressure is 99 kilopascals. And over here, the ambient pressure where you are standing, say you're at the coastline, you're at sea level, is 101 kilopascal. That means that there's a pressure difference between the inside of a stack and the outside of a stack, which is quite a lot. What that will look like in practice, if you're going to open this board, there will be a lot of air rushing into the stack from the higher pressure to the lower pressure. Flow always occurs from a high pressure to a low pressure, velocity being dependent on the size of the pressure difference and the resistance that the flow is encountering. So what will in effect happen if you disconnect this line? Let's say, for instance, our measurements over here in millimeters of water was, say, one millimeter of water. That's a bit low. Let's say 10 millimeters of water we had when we measured our differential pressure here. So dp equals, get this written out a bit neater, dp equals 10 millimeters of water over here. Our measurement on our manometer or your instrument device that you may be using in the field. If you were to remove this leg now, you will now not measure the pressure difference only due to the flow going into the stack relative to stack conditions, which is what these little static pressure points are measuring for us. You will now be measuring the pressure difference due to the kinetic energy. Firstly, that will still be measured. That will still exert a force here. There will now be another pressure difference being measured, which will be the difference between the inside of the stack and the outside of the stack. So your actual new DP that you'll be measuring now will now not be 10 millimeters anymore. This picture will change. This pressure here is higher than that pressure, so in effect what will be happening, the ambient pressure will be pushing down in on this leg and moving this liquid up by 2,000 pascal, because that difference is 2 pascal, while the effect from the flow will be counteracting it. That is why it's critical to have the second leg connected. If, let's say for example, you use this manometer of yours and you only connect the yellow leg, what will be measuring then? Then, the pressure at atmosphere is 101 kilopascal, inside the stack is 99 kilopascal. What will be happening? The atmospheric pressure here is pushing down at 101 kilopascal, and inside this stack, we are now not connected in this flow leg, we are just we perpendicular to it, so the pressure exerted through these little small holes, these static holes over here, is 99 kilopascal, Pushing through the outside sea, through that little tube down here. So you have 99 kilopascal pushing down here, you have 101 pushing down here. That measurement should then be the same as 2 kilopascal. So your dp should be equivalent to 2 kilopascal, which is 2000 pascal divided by 9.8. That should be about 205 millimeters of water that you will be reading. Okay, so. Now I did this with a type 1 pitot tube over here. Let's move that one out of the way. We can move that equation out of the way. I'll get back to that. Type S pitot tube over here. What is the difference? The working principle is the same. You will still have your positive leg connected over here. You just draw it a little bit better than me. That will be this leg over here. And your negative leg I'm just going to draw this quickly, it's not going to be pretty. 
but it'll work. Connect it over there. We can forget about what's happening in this box over here now. We'll just actually check if it's still the right way around. We have flow going in from your beta tube. Push down on this leg due to velocity. And you will measure a pressure difference like that. The DP will actually be slightly higher than what we initially measured with the type 1. The type 1 we measured 10. So on this we should be getting something closer to 8.4. Now why is that? That is because the static pressure leg on the type S beta tube it is slightly disturbed by the eddies and the current at the back of this probe over here and that is compensated for when you do the actual calculation by using a different CV value in your equation. The type 1 is a more direct measurement or closer to the working principle of it. The type S has a little correction factor built into it but the reason we use the type S more often is because they are less prone to blockages. Those little static holes on a type 1 get blocked rather easily. Okay, so let's start off with an example of how to actually do the calculation. Here we have our equation, and in this equation we have our constant for the beta tube, CV. In this case it will be 0 0.84 because it's a type S beta tube. Then we have 2 delta P. This is the Greek symbol for delta. Now in this case I wrote for the data, I wrote delta as a DP. It is the same thing, DP or delta P. It's a differential pressure that you measured at that specific point where this velocity is calculated. And then we have rho underneath here, which is the gas density. Now you will notice I have not given us the gas density, as in most cases we don't actually measure the density directly. We calculate it using the ideal gas law. Now, the ideal gas law looks something like this, where it tells us the relationship between pressure, temperature, and the volume of a gas. This ideal gas law can be manipulated to give us the density. Okay, so you can rewrite this equation to get density is equal to pressure times the molar mass of the gas, which is what I've given us here, R, which is a constant, so we don't bother with that too much, we just get it from literature or from data that is known, and then the temperature, which is the other thing we measure. So the things that we need to know to get the density, which are seen also the things that affect the velocity, is the gas pressure in the stack, so the stack pressure, the temperature, and the molar mass, of the gas, which is another way of saying the composition. The motor mass will change as the composition changes. A standard is to measure oxygen, carbon dioxide, and water as these are the major components in most fluid stack gases. In this case, we didn't do the measurements. I'll do a video on how to get motor mass averages and calculation of densities later on. But for this case, I'm just going to give us a motor mass of 29 grams per gram mole, which is that of standard air. But we can substitute this density this over here. Let's just assume very quickly that the density is known and let's say the density is 1 or 2 gram per cubic meter. That's kilogram per cubic meter, that is the density, that is rho. I'm not going to make it formal in black here because technically if you use this parameters you'll get a different density as we'll see now. But if that was the case then this calculation would look something like 0 0.84 times the square root of, let me draw that in you with a pen quickly, uh, might be a bit easier, square root of 2 delta P, which is in this case 20 pascals, so that will be a 20 on top of a line, just move that in there, and the density at the bottom of a line, that is 1.2, and we can pop that into a calculator, and that should give us an answer, let's quickly get a calculator out here, and we just call that 3.4 meters per second. Okay, so now I cheated a bit and I used this pump suck density, which should be close to the truth. Let's see if we were actually to do it with the density that we need to substitute in there, how that calculation will look. So, a different way if we substitute the density from the ideal gas law into this equation, we get something that looks a bit like this. I'm going to enlarge it a bit. Same as before, we can now just substitute all our values in there, so we can say that is equal to 0 0.84 times, let's get this text a bit smaller, 0 0.84 times the square root of, above the line, we have that 2 times 2 times 10 pascal times 8.314 for our gas constant. Just be always sure to check your units on your constant when you're using it, times 303 Kelvin for the temperature. 
divided by the pressure of the stack, which is 99, times the molar mass of 29. And if we plug that all into our calculator, we will get the following answer. 3.5 meters per second. Not very far off from my previous one, where we just guessed the density of 1.2, but that is because the 1.2 is very close to the density of air at these conditions. Okay, so there you have it. That is how you calculate the velocity. The important thing to note here is that the velocity is actually dependent on the density of a gas and therefore the composition, the endless molar mass, the temperature and the pressure. So if you have a device or handheld instrument that gives you a reading in meters per second directly, just know that if the composition of a gas is significantly different than whatever that device is programmed for, which is most likely going to be for pure air, if you're measuring a combustion gas, say with 10% oxygen and 8% carbon dioxide, the velocity reading will be affected by that and will be slightly off. We will see when we actually do our isokinetic calculations, you need to tell your machine what velocity to sample at, and therefore we do a preliminary little calculation of this, just so that we can be ballpark with our velocity so that we know at which rate to sample, but more on that will come later. Okay, so here we have the two equations that we just used to calculate velocity at a point. I just want to touch on how you get the average stack velocity. For the average stack velocity, you do not calculate the average differential pressure that you measured at all of those points and plug that into the formula. That will not give you the correct answer. You will calculate the velocity at each of the points measured using their respective differential pressures. So you'll do this for each point measured and then you take the average of all those velocities. These equations can be written in other forms sometimes. This is from the EPA method 2. Here is EPA method 2. This is just a way of mathematically saying you will take the average of all the velocities. And then they have this Kp or constant over here. That constant there includes this 2 we are carrying along. It includes our gas constant R over here. And it includes whatever conversion factor you need to get this differential pressure converted. So they are all equivalent. And if you just keep track of your unit, you should have no trouble with them at all. All right, now for the last bit, this is just going to be some industry experience or first-hand experience. If you are working with a type Espido tube and you are unsure of your reading, just flip the tube around and flip your umbilical tubing that's connected around and you should get the same answer because the type Espido tube doesn't care which way you use it. Both legs should be similar if the pedo tube is in good working condition and that should be checked by calibration. If that is the case, both sides should give you the same answer. I will always advise if you're working on site, air in a can is a good thing to have. Blow out the tubes frequently after every test perhaps. Perhaps you're working on a wet and dirty stack, then the pedo tubes have a tendency to get clogged. You might notice this as the velocity or the differential pressures that you are measuring will start drifting in a certain direction. So most likely they will slowly decrease as the test goes on. So you're running a one hour test, you start off with the differential pressure measurement of 50 at point one, and next time you get to point one, the differential pressure measurement is now 25, but nothing in the process changed. If you're working on site with a pitot tube like this, you'll type S. It is very important that you protect this tip because that tip is what determines what your factor will be. So in this case, 0.84. And if you damage this tip on site and for one side sounds slightly differently bent than the other side, this factor will change and your readings might not be valid or your readings will definitely be influenced by it. You have a backup device on site that you can use as a reference. So perhaps you're using a nice kinetic sampling machine and you're measuring velocity using your combined probe with its own pitot tube. A loose type S pitot tube with a handheld device is always handy to have in case you're unsure of a measurement or in case there's a strange trend in the measurements to verify that your device is functioning properly. Okay, so that's that for velocity calculation. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments and I will answer them. If you require any additional information, such as perhaps assistance with unit conversions, you can also put it in the comments and I'll see if I can assist. There will also be a video coming, by the way, on unit conversion soon, but for the time being, you're welcome to leave any questions in the comments.